So I've wanted to do this series for some time, being a former vet student and all, of me going through the subjects that I have already passed in vet school because doing subjects that I haven't passed wouldn't make any sense. So I'm going over the stuff that I have passed just to freshen things up for myself while also telling you guys about cool stuff about animals, right? So this is on a long time basis. It's not gonna be video for video after this one because one, I have other video ideas and two, it can take a lot of time to research and refresh and understand these things again. So, you know, it's not gonna be video for video, but I really want to come up some of the subjects, those being genetics, zoology, histology, and maybe some anatomy and physiology, depending on how popular the other videos get, because it is a lot of research on those subjects. They're pretty heavy. Just fair warning for you as well. I also might split up some of the subjects because covering a whole subject in one video can quickly make it a long one. And this is also split up and yet it's this long. But I thought about starting out with zoology because zoology is also one of the subjects that we start out in the vet education. It is a good introduction to anatomy and animals overall. And we also get to learn about some different animals before having five years of just mammals, you know, dogs, cats, cattle, all of this. So what better way I thought to start out this series with talking about bird zoology. If you didn't watch my subject rundown video of what I learned from my first year in vet school, zoology is a very evolution oriented subject where we basically learn a lot about the different animal kingdoms and genuses and species and how all the same bones basically from the same fish have evolved into all of these different species. At least that is how it's taught in you know the vet education because you can take a whole zoology education this is not the only thing to it and that is also why i'm going to simplify a lot of the things because again you can take a whole education in zoology that's not what i have we had this subject for maybe three months then at the end of these three months we're giving a multiple choice exam and yes they cared enough about the subject to give us a multiple choice exam but it's passed it's done, so I'm qualified to tell you guys about this, I think. Just want to mention before I begin, the sources that I use for most of these videos are the presentations and the presentation notes that I took and were given by my professors in the veg education. And I also do have a lot of books, of course, on these different subjects. So I do have a zoology book that we were told to buy by the same professor if we wanted to expand our knowledge, because I'm gonna be honest, I did not read this book at all, but I have read some of it now and it's actually a pretty good book. So those are my sources, just for those that are curious and want to know where this information is coming from. So let's just start at the very beginning because many of you might know that birds are the closest relatives that we have to dinosaurs in the modern animal kingdom. And the reason we know this is because of a fossil find in the 1860s of the first known bird given the name Archaeopteryx. And fun fact, this is the prehistoric bird that the Pokemon Archaeopteryx is based upon and the resemblance is just undeniable. What a beauty. What was special about the Archaeopteryx was that despite having a lot of bird-like features like feathers and a beak-like mouth, it also had a lot of reptile features like longer limbs and teeth and therefore it was classified as an intermediate between reptiles and birds, meaning a reptile showing evolutionary steps towards becoming a bird, so an intermediate form of this evolution. Now the reptiles in question were of course the dinosaurs and more specifically the theropods. And these are the groups of dinosaurs that have very famous names like the T-Rex, the Velociraptor, the Allosaurus and my personal favorite dinosaur, the Spinosaurus. So the Archaeopteryx is obviously not around anymore and this is due to the mass extinction that happened at the end of the Cretaceous period. However, its descendants, being the smaller avian species, managed to survive and some of the core reasons behind that were that they were not only omnivores but they could crack open nuts with their beak as well as just their ability to fly, making them harder to catch for predators while also making traveling to find food way more efficient. And so today we have all sorts of birds that have adapted to live all sorts of different places and eat a variety of things. 
And in zoology, you might have heard terms like class, order, and family to describe an organism. And I'm just quickly gonna go over what those means, not in total detail, because then this video can be way longer. But let's just start out with the domain, which there are three of. And this is the fundamental cell, so to say, that the organism arrived from. So we have bacteria, archaea, archaea, and eukarya. Some figures will say that, they say that there's only two since archaea is technically a branch of eukarya, but here let's just say that there's three. And life including plants and animals are eukarya. And I also just want to mention I'm probably going to mispronounce a whole lot of different things because I'm used to saying these words either in Danish or in Latin. So Sorry for any mispronunciation. <laughs> then there's kingdom, which for animals is, you guessed it, animalia, and for plants, it's planty. And then there's the other four that no one cares about. <laughs> so the next one is hara, and this one is phylum. So phylum is basically how the embryonic evolution is of the skeleton, which you know helps us further describe what animal we're looking at. So birds belong to the same phylum as humans being the chordate phylum. And this is because we have a notochord at some point in our lives. So do birds. The largest phylum is the arthropods, which are classified by having an exoskeleton. So this is basically all insects and why this is the largest phylum. Then we get to class, which is daily talk, because this is how we narrow animals down into, you know, reptilia, reptiles, you have your mammals, you have your aves, those are birds, you have your fish, or as their uh, class is actually called, uh, actinoepterygii. So let's just stick with fish, shall we? <laughs> The order describes the kind of mammal or bird we're looking at. So for dogs and many mammal predators, this is carnivora. So you might be quick to say that a zebra is herbivora then, but no, those guys are classified by how many fingers they mainly carry their weight with. I wish I was kidding. <laughs> Now for bird order is pretty easy because it's how we differentiate stuff like parrots, penguins, falcons, owls, you get the deal. Now with the last three, we get into a detail level that I don't want to explain because it's, yeah, it's very difficult to explain how we differentiate those. But the last three are family, genus, and species. And people actually often get genus and species mixed up when it comes to parrots, because in daily talk, we like to say that, for example, two parrots like a conure and a pionis are different species. However, they are actually different genuses of parrots. While a blue-headed pionis and a bronze-winged pionis are the same genus, but different species. Now, if we get down to a green cheek conure specifically compared to a blue and gold macaw specifically, they are different species. But talking just about conures in general compared to maybe Amazon parrots or macaws in general, you are actually talking different genuses, not different species. I'm a victim of this too, by the way. I do this as well all the time, so. Now with some animals, it of course makes sense to go even further down. So for dog breeds, for example, it's family dogs that are in the species called Canis familiaris, and then are further divided into breeds. And then there are categories like subspecies, super families, and whatnot. Again, you can take a whole education in this. Getting back to birds, there are around 9,700 different bird species all around the world. And 59% of all of these species belong in the order of sparrows. But what even is or classifies something as being a bird then? And no, it's not as simple as saying they can fly because there are such a thing as a flightless bird like penguins and ostriches. And also bats can fly, but bats are mammals. And fun fact, there are actually the only mammals to do so. For something to be classified as a bird, it has more so to do with how they are anatomically built. So for something to be a bird, it would need mainly three things, being feathers, a beak, and talons. But furthermore, and this goes for most birds, birds are endothermic like mammals with a body temperature of around 40 to 42 degrees Celsius. So they are a bit warmer than us humans and also have divided heart chambers, giving them double blood circulation, but more on this later. And they reproduce via eggs with an amniotic sac, 
Lastly, their ventilation system is built around multiple air sacs. Again, I'll get into this later, but this is what classifies something as being a bird or belonging in the class of aves. And all birds will have these features, so let's go over them more in detail. Let's just start out with how feathers work, and this is where I'm going to give you the first two anatomical terms, which are dermis and epidermis. And you might have heard these before. So epidermis is the outermost layer of your skin, while dermis is the next layer that houses the blood cells, nerve endings, and more of course, you get the idea. So to say it in technical terms, feathers are an epidermal formation of keratin that's established as a skin wart. And this skin wart will later become a feather bud. Now, while the feather is then developing, it is supplied with blood from the dermis layer of the skin. And you might have heard the terms blood feather and pin feather before, but what do they mean exactly? Let me try and explain that. When a bird is molting, it basically means that it is replacing all of its feathers. And as I mentioned, feather starts out as just a little skin wart of keratin that is then supplied with blood from the dermis. Now, while the feather grows, it later becomes what is referred to as a pin feather. But while also being a pin feather, it is a blood feather in the beginning because it is still supplied by blood from the dermis. So should this pin feather get damaged, the bird will start to bleed. However, as the pin feather starts to grow, the blood supply will only be at the base of the shaft, while the rest of the feather will be encased in a waxy coating coming from the shaft. And when the feather is done, there will no longer be a blood supply and it will just be left as a pin feather. Now, in order for this pin feather to then become an actual feather, the bird needs to remove the wax. And this is what they do during preening. They are removing the wax from their tiny pin feathers, freeing the feather, so to say. And it is also what they want our help with whenever they tilt their head or tilt their head to their pack mates. It is to remove the wax layer and free their feather from their heads because they can't do that on their own. So when fully formed, feathers are what we like to call a dead structure, and this is because they don't have a blood supply anymore, they just stand as is. I just want to mention that while you should never ever clip your bird, this is however why that even a bird that has been clipped will mold out new feathers, because no matter what happens to the feather structure down here doesn't affect what is happening up at the bird's skin and the establishment of a new feather. When and how often birds molt really depends on what order of birds we're talking about. Ducks, for example, like to just get it over with quickly and molt their entire coat at once, actually making some of them unable to fly at some times of the year, while some birds like hawks only shed one feather at a time because they are so reliant on their flying ability. Parrots will usually molt twice a year in the fall and spring, however, some individuals might do it earlier and some later. There are different types of feathers, of course, and I'm going to show them to you later. But generally, a feather consists of a quill, ratches, barbs, and barbules, while the ratches, barbs, and barbules form the feather's fan. So the barbules can either face forwards or backwards and consists of these small hooks. So they basically hook onto each other and form a flat surface. And this is a very smart system in regards to feather damage, because should the barbules unhook from each other, they can always come back together. To demonstrate, this is Charlie's flight feather. I unhook the hooks and I get the barbules back together, so to say. Sure, you can see where it's ripped, but now it's basically back together. Awesome! So as I showed you, this was one of Charlie's flight feathers and there are six kinds of feathers in total. We have flight feathers, which are very asymmetrical and the birds obviously use them for flight. And these are further divided into primary and secondary flight feathers, depending on where they are on the bird. Then there's tail feathers, also very important regarding flight and steering. However, the tail feathers are more symmetrical, not always, but more symmetrical. Then there's contour feathers. They can also be called the covering feathers or something like that, since they are the smaller colorful feathers that cover the bird's entire body. Not to be confused with down feathers, those are something else, but contour feathers are the colorful ones that cover the bird's body. And then there's phyllo plume feathers, which are feathers that have very long and narrow shafts. And you know, despite all birds having them, they are actually barely visible on all of them. 
Now, lastly, there's the down feathers, of course. And for parrot owners, these are the ones we have to vacuum constantly. But more technically speaking, they function as isolation for the bird and helps them regulate body temperature by either lifting them to release the heat or lowering them to contain the heat. Now, as humans, we can sweat, and that is actually because we have glands at the dermis layer of our skin. However, birds actually have absolutely no glands in their skin. The only gland that a bird have is the uropygial gland, or oil gland, or scent gland, preening gland. This guy has many names. <laughs> but because birds have very little skin exposure, they need help producing vitamin D. And this is where the wax from the uropygial gland does its magic, since it contains vitamin D precursors meaning that when exposed to sunlight, they are transformed into vitamin D. So when a bird is preening, it goes to the gland and then distributes this wax from the gland to the feathers, giving all sorts of benefits like the feathers becoming waterproof and also catalyzing this vitamin D production. I have no idea how to do this transition, so let's just talk about the bird skeleton. Because <laughs> evolving to fly has meant that the bird skeleton is very compact, with some bones like the sternum being relatively massive, especially if you look at something like a hummingbird, that guy got gains. And this is in order for the bird to develop big flight muscles. To further decrease the weight of the skeleton, the bird's tail or the last vertebra has fused together to form what we call a pygostyle. You can dive way more into the skeletal structure of the bird, of course, I'm not going to be able to cover everything. But I just wanted to cover some of the key points that I thought were interesting. So basically, birds' bones are specialized in a way whereas the upper part of their body is very light, being their neck and their head. And then the chest region is pretty big to ensure that bigger flight muscles can hold the bird during flight. Their beak is also a bone that has evolved in so many ways depending on the bird's diet. Do they need to crack open nuts, tear flesh, or do they prefer to catch fish? And the same goes for the feet. Do they sit in trees? Do they need them to hunt? Or do they use most of their time in water and need their feet to swim? I also want to add, if you didn't know, that birds actually have fingers and they have three of them. There is obviously, again, so much to talk about when it comes to bird anatomy. But some things about the skeletons I just want to mention is that all birds are built the same way. And so you might think, how can a toucan and an ostrich be built the same way? But they actually are. The fundamental bones are the same. What it comes down to is the length of these bones to maybe make space for bigger running muscles to adapt to the environment that the ostrich lives in or something like that. But another unique thing about their skeleton is actually their cervical vertebra or the skeleton in you know their neck, the bones in their neck. And these are very unique for birds because they are what is called heterocereal, I think. That is what they, call, they are called in, in Latin and I could not find a translation in English. So hetero, heterocereal, he, heterocereal, I don't know. We'll go with that, but it basically means that the neck is able to move both up and down and from side to side And this is why a bird can reach almost anywhere in its body except the head and it's very unique for birds Now I'm not gonna dive into diet for obvious reasons But I still want to talk about the GI tract birds have a very high metabolism and therefore also digests food extremely quickly this is mostly due to their size, since the smaller the bird, the quicker it loses heat and therefore will need more food to contain its ideal body temperature. And this is also why you will notice that the smaller the bird, the more it will poop. <laughs> It also becomes harder to fly if the bird has a pressing food in its intestines, which is why they want to just get rid of it in a span of a couple of hours. Birds have also evolved a crop at the start of their GI tract, which is basically so that they can store food for later, or in nature they would maybe store food for their chicks, and then feed them by basically throwing up in their mouth. You've seen it before. When the bird actually wants to eat something, the food will first arrive to what is called the proventriculus. And this is where the bird's digestive enzymes and acids are ready for, yeah, you guessed it, digestion. <laughs> 
A pretty cool thing is that birds that live near the water has actually evolved a salt gland that just makes sure that salt that's ingested when hunting can actually exit the body again so that it doesn't mess up the system. After the food has been in the proventriculus, it will be further digested in the bird's gizzard, which is basically a big grinder that chops up the food into teeny tiny pieces before all the good nutrients are absorbed in the small intestine, going into the large intestine, to the rectum, and then the waste exit via the cloaca. So let's talk feces, shall we? <laughs> Bird feces is a lot like reptile feces in a way that it contains urinary acid. And it is this thicker white substance that surrounds the actual poop whenever you see a bird poop. That's urinary acid. The idea behind this mechanism of just getting urinary acid out with your feces is that the urinary acid is produced by the kidneys and then don't need to be dissolved in water, thereby not only removing the bird's need for extra water, but also the urinary bladder altogether. So birds do not have a urinary bladder. And the reason behind this is that by removing the need from, for extra water and the need for a urinary bladder, the bird removes a lot of weight. So basically saves weight to make flying more efficient. Now all the bird's feces, including urinary acid and you know the actual poop, will exit through the cloaca. Cloaca? Cloaca? Waga waga? <laughs> So for male birds, this is also where the semen will secrete when mating and females will also lay eggs via the cloaca. So when mating, it is cloaca to cloaca and then the fun begins. Let's take a look at the female's ovaries because while many other animals have a larger number of functional ovaries, the female bird only has one, meaning only one egg is being produced at a time and it takes the bird around 24 hours to produce an egg. Now the egg production process is pretty hard to explain without getting too technical, but trying to explain it as simple as possible, the ovum or the yolk, called the ovum in Latin, is released and then added egg white called albumin. Then it is covered in all the membranes the embryo needs basically to survive before it's covered by calcium in the uterus resulting in the creation of the eggshell itself basically. Lastly, the egg is then added pigmentation, you know, if the bird has maybe spotted eggs or green eggs before again getting coated, this time with a sort of protein and then laid. Now I'm not going to talk about how the embryo then evolves because this video is already pretty long, but let me know if you want me to make videos on these individual topics, maybe diving more into something that I've talked about in this video and then I'll see if my brain can handle it. But let's end by talking about more cool stuff inside the bird. <laughs> Compared to their size, birds have relatively big hearts with a high frequency in order to always be ready to fly and get enough oxygen out to the muscles to do, you know, the flying itself. <laughs> Furthermore, bird blood cells actually contain a nucleus, just like reptiles and fish blood cells also do, which makes the cell itself able to live longer and overall just improves the bird's homeostasis. And homeostasis is a term that just translates to having a system in balance or you know, having better stability of your overall system. The bird wants to keep its system in homeostasis. It wants to keep it stable. Now birds' lungs do actually not move at all, but are instead connected to a whole system of air sacs. And there are nine of these in total that basically moves for the lungs. The way it works is that these air sacs basically just hold the air for the lungs and starts by taking the air to the air sac that is located behind the lungs to make the air only enter the lungs from one way being behind. And this enables them to have a continuous flow of air through the lungs, remember the lungs don't change volume. And this just results in way better oxygen exchange in the bronchi. So it's an extremely developed and effective system. This is also why birds are extremely good at flying at higher altitudes, because even though there isn't much, much oxygen in the air, the birds are just very good at utilizing the oxygen that is there by taking in a large volume of air, store it, and then really utilize the oxygen in that air. On top of this, of course, birds just inhale and exhale extremely quickly, having this constant flow in the lungs. I want to end off by just quickly going over the bird's senses. Again, if you want me to, I can talk about this in detail, but I just thought I would mention these things really quickly. 
Now birds sense and taste and smell are not very developed, but their eyesight on the other hand is where they really shine. If you think about it, birds like hawks, owls and other predators need to be able to spot prey from a really far distance in, able, in order to hunt it down. And I couldn't find the correct translation, I think. I think it's tap cells, but it could also be cone cells. I found some translations saying, I'm gonna say tap cells because that's closest to what we call it. But we basically have tap cells in our eyes. Birds have way more, which basically makes them see around eight times better than us humans. So I think I'm gonna end it here. There is, as I've mentioned, a lot to talk about. We also got taught in how flying works specifically how the eye is structured and of course a lot of more details into the GI tract and the bone structures and whatnot. But I want to keep this video on a level so as those that are new to birds, don't know anything, can tune in and listen and hear what I have to say, while those that maybe already know something about birds also can find some interesting facts. Because I plan on doing more of these, I would love to hear you guys' feedback. I really debated with myself whether to split this video up further, maybe only talking about feathers or something like that. But let me know if you would rather have me split it up further into maybe 10 to 15 minute videos instead of these longer ones. I also like doing these longer ones if that's what you prefer. Just let me know, my ears are open. Also information wise, was it too hard to understand? Do I need to maybe explain some more things in more detail for you to understand it correctly or all of this? Or do you maybe want me to go even harder on all of the anatomical terms and whatnot, let me know. I'm here for you guys at the end of the day, still doing what I like, but format and all of this, we can always change. So, bye.